Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Rehabilitation Sciences YouTube channel. We are here with a very interesting topic today, post-stroke motor recovery through motor learning strategy. And we are privileged to have uh, Dr. Arsile Jane C. Calirio. Uh, welcome you, ma'am, on the YouTube channel. Ma'am, uh, we would like to have your consent to make your this lecture live on your YouTube channel, ma'am. Yes, you have my consent. Thank you. Thank you so much. And moderator today, Dr. Sagun Agrawal, we have with us. And he'll be formally introducing our faculty today and start the session. Dr. Sagun, you can start the session, sir. Thank you, Dharam, sir. Welcome to the Rehabilitation Sciences. Uh, welcome, friends. Today, we I have got the privilege to uh, invite our guest, Dr. Archel Jan C. Calizio. She is instructor in faculty of uh, physiotherapy in University of Santo Thomas in the College of Rehabilitation Sciences in Department of Physiotherapy. Dr. Chell, she did her bachelor's in physiotherapy from the University of East Bremen Magnesi Memorial Medical Center, Philippines, and her master's also from the same college in the epidemiology. Her research interest is focuses on the neurological rehabilitation, including a research entitled Improving Motor Performance of the Hemiparetic Stroke Using CIMT Technique. She is a distinguished speaker in a various platforms of the Philippines. She is a very good social worker. She uh, takes up a lot of lecture on the social things. She has been awarded Best Academician Award by the Department of Science and Technology of the Philippines government. She is the vice chair of the, the Neurological Special Interest Group of Philippines Physiotherapy Association. We welcome you, Chell. Thank you for giving us time and coming on the rehabilitation side. So, thank you, Dr. Shagun, for that very, very um, pleasing welcome. And before I begin my, my webinar for today, my lecture, I would like to greet India a happy 74th Independence Day. And from the Philippines, good evening, everybody. Okay, so let's start um, the topic that I will be talking today, which is very dear in my heart. And this is the post-stroke motor recovery through motor learning strategy. So for this lecture, you will be, I hope, I hope that I could teach you or share some of the techniques that I usually do for patients, especially for patients with stroke. Okay, so yeah, happy Independence Day, India. And I am very much um, uh, privileged to be given this opportunity to talk to all of you, especially on this very special occasion. Okay, all right. So, oops, I, okay, so I've, I've already been introduced by Dr. Shagun. Thank you so much. And um, I've been practicing physical physiotherapy for almost two decades now. And um, my passion is really about neuro rehabilitation. So what are the objectives, objectives that I am hoping to inculcate to you after, after this lecture? First is I would like to um, make you understand the relevance of neuroplasticity, especially for recovery of people who suffered from stroke. And with that, I also would like to share, uh, share with you the principles of motor control and learning and how it will be helpful to our physical therapy practice. And most especially share with you some of the strategies I do in order to help these patients using motor learning strategies. Now, the very main premise of this webinar is to somehow um, uh, teach you how to, how to organize your, your management strategy. So I, because we all, we, all, we all know that treating a patient with, with stroke entails a lot of practices. So I hope in this lecture, I would be able to help you and somehow educate you and share my expertise on how I, I do organize my plan of care for these patients. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so this is a very good um, data that I was able to um, learn when I attended the um, Association of um, Stroke Conference, Asia Pacific Stroke Conference last year that was held in the Philippines. And they shown us the global burden of stroke that is happening on, in this region. And as you can see, the Asia Pacific has been suffering from, from the stroke, from this condition in a, in a very high percentage. 
and the redder the color is, it means that there are a lot of people suffering from stroke as to modifiable risk factors. So India would be around, would be at the, I think in the South Asia. So as you can see, we have like a very, um, very distinct color, red color, which means that there are a lot of people suffering from stroke due to modifiable risk factors. Now this table will show us, oops, I'm sorry, okay. This table will show us the summary of the modifiable risk factors that the global, um, global the, 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 the entire world is suffering from. And as you can see, on a global perspective, the first one is high systolic blood pressure. And then the last would be smoking. And in South Asia, in which the India is in, take note that you have like um, a different, a different um, uh, level of, of uh, leveling of which modifiable risk factors that contributes to stroke. First, you have the high systolic blood pressure, then you have diet, low in fruits. And then the third one is, as you can see, air pollution contributes mainly why a people in your country suffers from stroke. And then the fourth one here is diet low in vegetables. And then the fifth one is high body, oh, sorry, diet high in sodium. Now, as you can see, this is something that I really appreciate because in every region, there's like a different modifiable risk factor that contributes to uh, why a person suffers from stroke. And globally, and globally, there's a stroke victim for every two to three seconds. So imagine how many patients have been suffering from this condition and how relevant our practice in terms of getting them back to their pre-morbid state. So um, I'm going to share you this um, very good table. So I guess um, it's, gonna, it's a refreshing thing to know what are the modifiable risk factors that are commonly contributing to people who suffers from stroke. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So whenever I do, okay, whenever I do a face-to-face -face lecture or a seminar, I always engage my participants to participants to move with me to um, uh, I encourage them to be interactive. So in this course, in this webinar, I hope, I really do hope that you participate because this is one of the way that you can appreciate motor learning strategies, okay? All right, so let's start with this video. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I hope you're familiar with him. Yes. And he is? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Who is he, Dr. Shagun? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm here. All right. So this is Michael Jackson, I, one of the legends, okay? And one of the iconic moves that he made popular, okay, with, with he made popular is the moonwalk. Okay. All right. So this movement might be a little complex, but I promise you after this slide, you're gonna learn how to do the moonwalk. But of course, you're gonna need to follow my instructions and hopefully you'll get up from your you get out from your seat and then <laughs> follow these simple instructions. All right. Okay, I can't see you all, but I really do hope that you participate. Okay, all right. So you're gonna be um, somewhat Michael Jackson after this slide. Okay, so let's try to um, let's try to learn how is this complex movement be done in just four simple steps. Okay, all right. <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> I have faith that you are doing what I am gonna be instructing because, like I said, it's very uh, it would be it would be nice if you're gonna be appreciating the movement. Okay. Let's dance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's get started. Okay, so first up is lift your right heel. All right, lift your right heel. Then push your left foot back. There you go, okay? <laughs> Push your left foot back. Then after that, you shift your weight from left foot 
going to the right. Okay, I guess this is gonna be becoming a little bit complicated. Okay, shift your weight from one foot to the other and then you push your right foot back. Okay, so we, we, repeat, the, we repeat the process again. Okay, let's do this again. All right, lift your right foot back. Whoops, <laughs> push your left foot back. Shift your weight from one foot to the other and this time push your left foot back. Okay, all right. Were you able to do it? Okay, let's do it again. Again, it might not be a little perfect after this slide, but hopefully you'll have the idea of how to do the moonwalk. Okay, so that's my contribution for tonight. <laughs> you learned how to do the moonwalk steps. Okay, so you lift your right foot, push your left foot back, you shift your weight from the left going to the right and then you push your right foot back and then you repeat until such time it becomes much smoother okay and you get acquainted with the movement all right okay so i really do hope that i was able to give justice that after this slide you kind of have the idea of how to do the moonwalk may i hear something from the from the ones that, is, that are that are um, watching Definitely, live. Chal, we are getting a PS on the YouTube. Yay! Oh, yes, okay, yes. all right. <laughs> okay, so anyhow, I really do hope that you were able to do the moonwalk. So this was me in Thailand <laughs> learning the moonwalk. Okay, and after after just following the simple step. Okay, there you go. All right. So I so I hope that you were able to do the the, the moonwalk in this um in this um simple instruction. So what's the relevance of including teaching you the simple step? It's because it's how we appreciate motor learning strategies. Okay, so along this lecture, you will be learning the relevance, the importance of teaching the specifics of movement and how it will create a meaningful movement for our patient. Okay, so that comes with motor learning strategies. Okay, so by definition, these are sets of internal processes. When you say internal processes, these are the experience felt by the actual patient or person, which is associated by practice, so repetition of movement, and by way of experiencing that movement. That's why I really encourage you to follow my simple instructions whenever I told you so, so that you can appreciate the entire purpose of motor learning. And when you combine practice and experience, this could lead to a more permanent change in our brain, okay? All right. And according to Fitz and Posner, motor learning is, um, uh, is composed of three stages. So we have cognitive, which is the first stage. And in this stage, the patient is just learning the, the, the idea of the movement in which the movement could be a bit robotic, it could be a bit um, slowed. And in this case, it is important that you have to know that, 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 that the demonstration of movement would really matter. Because if the patient will be knowing okay, the correct strategy on how they do a certain skill, then definitely it, could, it will improve their overall function. So later on, I will, I will be sharing to you what are the recommended practice on how we can improve our patient's performance under this level. Now, the second stage is what we call as the associative stage in which from the word itself, the patient is now actually associating the learned behavior that was get that was gotten from the first stage of motor learning. Okay, and in this stage, you will also appreciate how to properly organize your therapy and in order for this patient to again get a meaningful functional performance from the program that you will be given. And the last stage of motor learning would be the autono autonomous stage. From the word itself, the movement at this point becomes automatic. Okay, so please remember that when a person or when a patient learns a certain skill, they'll have to undergo these three distinct stages in which the application of physiotherapy will also matter. Okay. All right. Now, this is a good um, representation of how a patient returns to sport or skill. Now, understand that the base of the pyramid entails that 
we have to make sure that we will be able to activate or re-educate the muscles that are necessary in a given skill. For example, if a patient will be learning how to stand up for the first time again after stroke on a chair, then we'll need to specify the muscles that are important in order for that patient to get up from the chair. For example, hip extensors, hamstrings, etc. Okay, so I'm gonna share that to you later. So the, the idea here is that if you want your patient to become more functional and would have a meaningful improvement after getting stroke, then it, it is recommended that we re-educate and specifically activate the muscles that are necessary in order for them to regain their function. Another good representation of the pyramid of learning is that the central nervous system plays an important role with the creation of the higher skills of motor learning. And in this case, it is also recommended or suggested that complete or as much as possible um, include assessment and evaluation if, uh, evaluation that will involve the central nervous system. For example, level of cognition, um, the alertness, the motivation of the patient, those smaller things will really have an impact on how the patient would learn and apply the skill later on. Okay, so as you can see on the third and then on the second level, um, there's the tactile, vestibular, and proprioception and then followed by the much detailed senses. And then before they would actually reach the motor planning level, all these items listed below, okay, must suffice, okay, must be sufficient enough, okay, that in order to reach this, this level of, of the improvement until such time that they reach the highest level of learning, okay? All right, so, what happens when a patient suffers from stroke? It's a very relative knowledge or general knowledge that we know as physiotherapists. There could be affectation of sensation, there could be motor, and in rare cases or in some cases when the, when the condition is so severe, it could be a multi-systemic affectation. But in physiotherapy, we know that when there's um, disconnection in the brain, there's a high chance that the, that the task won't be transformed into a, into a movement. But good thing, we are physiotherapists and we know how to bridge that gap. And that is through neuro rehabilitation. But the crucial thing is how do we properly apply these techniques so that this task could eventually be brought into a meaningful movement. Okay, so I guess I hope that this is something that you could uh, learn after at the end of this webinar. Okay, now a sad thing about um, stroke is that uh, when they get accustomed, accustomed to not moving that affected side, they tend to develop what we call as the learned not use cycle. This is a sad thing that a patient might get if they continuously not move the affected side. So our goal as physiotherapists is to as much as possible, not, do not let this patient get to this level, okay? So that is one of the goal of neuro rehabilitation is to somehow, okay, avoid our patients reaching the learned non-use cycle. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, so like I said, when a patient suffered from stroke, there are a lot of things that needs to be considered. But of course, okay, we need to prioritize as what was taught in our undergrad years. Whenever there are a lot of problems that needs to be considered, we'll need to prioritize. And in motor learning strategies from the word itself, we'll need to really prioritize or give emphasis on the most common motor deficits that are that are obviously seen when a patient suffered from stroke. Now, it may not be common to everyone, but, but it is, it is, it is um, something that you would normally observe when a patient suffered from stroke. And these are, number one, you have the balance deficits. Now, most of the patient after suffering from stroke 
I would um, I would uh, it's it's a common thing that you you observe that they really suffer from balance impairment. Then of course some patients would have difficulty walking back, okay, or 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 or, or have difficulty of regaining the ability to walk. Then there are also patients who needs our help to stand up properly from a chair. And most especially, the most difficult of all is to regain their upper extremity function. And unfortunately, there are some patients who stays for long, um, uh, suffered from stroke and, and has um, a prolonged deficit on the upper extremity. Okay, so let's now emphasize some of the, or the four common motor deficits that we encounter on a patient suffering from stroke. Number one is the balance deficits. So what are the common problems that we see in this patient? So you can see in the video, the patient tends to observe some adaptations in terms of space and, they, and she tends to be guarded in terms of how she ex executes the movement. At the same time, there's an evidence base of support Okay, which is kind of good, but then in the long run, it might, not, it might be detrimental to her function. Most especially if she gets accustomed to getting or placing a hands of, hands of for support into, into her walking aid. So the problem with a patient who gets accustomed with holding on to an unstable surface every time, every time they get up from a chair it increases the risk of fall, okay? So that is something that we won't, um, it, that is something that we would like to emphasize to our patients. As much as possible, they need to let go of their stick, assistive device, and not hold on to anything that is unstable because in the long run, this will contribute to fall, okay? All right, I will emphasize that later, next. Another problem that we encounter that are commonly seen among patients is that they, are, they have difficulty in um, achieving an independent standing up and sitting down. Now, the problem is there are some patients who can actually walk, but then they, are, they, they need some assistance to stand up. So obviously, there's no function at all. So our goal as physiotherapists is to somehow Okay, make them independent, not somehow, but obviously to make them independent so that, so that this skill would translate into a meaningful performance. So what are, some, what are some of the causes that makes a patient unable to stand up independently? Number one, it could be a very weak, okay, very weak lower extremity, or there are some tightness that is contributed by the abnormal synergies occurring on a patient with stroke, then there's decreased projection of body mass forward. Most of its common cause is that if there is improper placement of body segments whenever they do this activity. Okay, so later on, you're gonna realize why is it, why is it important to emphasize the proper body placement whenever we teach our patient to stand up for the first time, okay? All right, so that's the second one. Then the third one, obviously, is that after stroke, they have difficulty in walking, okay? And most of the common implication here is the circumducting gait. Now, this is a result of the combination of the strongest synergy, especially in the lower extremity, which tends to create an irregular or an abnormal posture for patients with stroke, okay? Now, it's not just also in the lower extremity, but also it's a common thing that is happening on the upper extremity. So when a patient suffers from, suffers from stroke, then these strong abnormal synergies creates a typical arm and leg posture, which is something that we'll also need to delay so that this patient could eventually have a more functional movement. And then finally, we have the reaching and manipulation problem, which is most of the time, the 
patients suffers from a learned non-use phenomenon. Now, I, I would be honest that treatment of the upper extremity is one of the most challenging um, aspect in neuro rehabilitation. And re literally, you will need a lot of patience to treat this patient, okay? But then um, hopefully, hopefully we could, um, we could try, I could try to somehow share you some, somehow share to you the techniques that I usually do for treatment, uh, for treatment of the affected upper extremity, okay? So again, uh, for, for upper extremity, the most common is that at this stage, they usually suffer from a learned non-use phenomenon in, in something that we, we need to avoid. And then, um, of course, pain is a common thing that we also, we also observe among these patients. Okay. All right. So physical therapy after stroke have already shown strong evidences that definitely it will enhance survival and independence after stroke. And at the same time, aside from us physiotherapists, there are also other teams that could also help us to make this patient regain their function, okay? So we are really a relevant facet in making this patient go back to their pre-morbid pre -morbid state. And the general physical therapy goals in relation to motor learning strategies would number one, I always make sure that the balance are restored, okay, all right, on this patient, because I believe, I believe that if balance is off, then a much high meaningful skill won't be possible, such as walking. Then another goal that needs to be emphasized would be re-education of mobility. That's why on the hierarchy of skill acquisition, muscle activation should be the base of your plan of care. And then ultimately, you develop the function after being able to acquire all these general, general goals for your patients. And it is also a known fact, okay, according to the clinical guidelines of stroke, that early mobilization when a patient suffered from stroke must happen immediately, okay, because you know that movement is vital, okay? Unless the patient is not declared as medically stable, then we'll have to wait a little bit. But then if the patient, okay, is cleared from anything that uh, is cleared for physiotherapy, then movement has to ensue right after or immediately, okay? So it's class one. So it's like it, that it's, it has a high level of evidence. And all patients, as what was mentioned, that should commence mobilization or out of bed activity. So movement of the limbs, such as PROM or whatever, is not enough. But then understand that it is recommended that they should experience out of bed activity 48 hours from the onset of stroke. Uh, but make sure that the patient is medically stable there, okay? All right, okay. Now, another important, and I guess um, uh, something that is uh, crucial in motor learning are the terms such as attention and set shifting and then offline motor learning. Okay, so what are these terms? Okay, so as defined, executive function as to attention and set shifting predicts higher magnitude of offline motor learning. So what are these terms that are relevant to our patient's, um, patient's um, function? Okay, when we say offline motor learning, these are the activities in which the patient learns even if they are not doing anything. For example, sleep. Sleep is very vital in terms of the recovery of our patients. That's why you, it's a common observation that right after suffering from any neurologic conditions, they tend to sleep a lot because sleep is one of the common strategies or one of the, um, uh, one of the way that how the CNS recovers from an insult. That's why this is something that we'll need to take advantage of when a patient is recovering from stroke. Another one is attention. This is the ability to focus on a certain task. That's why when we give certain 
intervention for our patients will have to make sure that they have a good attention so that learning can be formed. And then another one is that when you give plan of care to your patients, we have to ensure that we will be able to train them to unconsciously shift their attention from one task to another, which means that part of our plan of care is that we should train them how to perform a skill automatically, as what was mentioned in the Fitz and Posner scale of motor learning strategies. So these are some of the addition in terms of the motor learning strategy strategies, and that are number one, sleep is vital in learning. Number two, we have to ensure that when a patient receives physiotherapy program, the attention is good. And number three, our plan of care should include activities that will promote automaticity among these patients. Okay? All right. Okay. Now, when we combine strategies that will develop attention and then set shifting, this, is, this has known evidence that it will improve offline motor learning. And when there is improved offline motor learning combined with motor learning strategies, then it yields to a much better function among these patients. There you go. Okay. All right. So what are the most common post-stroke motor recovery that personally that I do in my practice, okay, through motor learning strategies. There are four. Like I said, I am always, uh, I always emphasize postural training in this patient. Sometimes I always put postural training on the top of my plan of care because like I said, with problems with balance could ensue, uh, could ensue a much, much progressive problem such as in the future, they might really have difficulty in walking or maybe an, um, an awkward way of walking. That's why we have to ensure that posture is good. Number two, the goals or, or rather the, the treatment that we should be given would be task specific. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to emphasize that later. Goal directed in order to improve motor control. Number three, in this webinar, you'll also be introduced to terms such as practices and feedback and how do we properly apply it in our treatment. And number three, group training increases motivation. So these are the four facet, facets of motor learning that could somehow contribute to the betterment of our patients. Okay, so let's start with postural training. Okay, so what are the things that we'll need to understand when we train our patient with regards to posture? Okay, and according to Verheiden et al. in 2014, people with chronic stroke have altered postural alignment in standing. So when we say chronic stroke, usually when a patient suffers from more than three months or more than six months, and when they enter the stage of chronic, chronic stage, Okay, there could be a um, great, effect, great effect on how the pelvis moves. That's why interventions focusing on increasing anterior and posterior pelvic tilt are recommended. Okay, because in the long run, when pelvic mobility will not be emphasized, then it could also um, affect how the patient deals with a much skillful activity such as walking, okay? So that's one thing that I would suggest in your intervention, ensure that you include pelvic exercises so that it could contribute to a much better postural, post posture, okay, rather posture, okay. And in postural control and orientation, which is the position of the body in relation to the body segment and the environment, there are three systems working together so that we can create a proper posture. Now, okay, this is the part that I will really want you to participate because I want you to, I want you to appreciate this part of the lecture, okay? So uh, now we will be appreciating 
the the interconnectivity of this three systems. Okay, are you ready? I I can't see you right now, but I have I have faith that you are <laughs> that you are doing my instructions. All right. So first task is I want you to stand up, get up from your chair. Okay. I want you to stand up, get up from your chair, stand on both feet with your hands on the side, and then you just have to open your eyes. Okay. I give you I'll give you five seconds. Maintain that posture. Okay, again, stand up, feet apart, hands on the side of your body, and just open your eyes. Okay, five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, so that is the feeling of how, of how you stand up properly with all these three systems working together now don't don't sit don't sit down yet we are not done <laughs> okay now this time i would like to make a point that if we remove one system will it re will it affect how our body assumes posture okay all right so the next activities or task would be a little bit challenging so i really do hope that you try to appreciate this because this is something that you would also share to your to your patients okay all right, so stand up, okay? I hope that you are on your feet right now. Stand up. Now this time, uh, hands on your side and close your eyes. Okay, close your eyes, no cheating. All right, I'm gonna count five seconds now. Five, four, three, two, and one. All right, I am sure that you are still standing on your feet, but the feeling is a bit different okay all right right because at this point we tend to remove the visual system and this time the vestibular system and the somatosensory are working hard to maintain our body uh, to maintain our posture so what's the implication of this patients who have a known degree of vis visual disorder may have a little difficulty on how to, uh, to attain an erect posture in standing. So we have to ensure that part of our evaluation is that we include that there is a functioning visual system. If not, we suggest some modifications to improve their vision. Okay, so I, I suppose you felt a little, you felt that when you close your eyes, you felt awkward or a bit scared or whatever but still you are standing on your feet because everyone here i get i i, I believe it's normal <laughs> we are all normal here okay task number three okay so this is gonna be a little bit challenging so i hope that um <laughs> i hope that nobody will be injured at this point at this point okay all right so stand on your feet hands on the side all right close your eyes and this time, I want you to stand on a leg. All right, okay. In five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, I am pretty sure that majority of you weren't able to attain okay, or to maintain an erect standing posture because this time I challenged the vestibular system. So imagine. If a patient has a known visual disorder with, um, with a very or a not so functioning vestibular system, imagine the challenge your patient is feeling, okay? So that is something that you would also want to ensure whenever you try to teach the patient posture for the first time. But we're not done yet. Okay, all right. Okay. Last challenge. And I really do hope that you are following this one. Okay, because this is something that you would also share to your patient. Okay. All right. Stand on, a, on your feet, hands on the side, close your eyes, stand on a leg and this time stand on your toes okay i am sure nobody was able to do that perfectly well because the last activity challenged all three systems therefore okay therefore it is crucial on postural training that we ensure that all these three systems are activated all right okay you may now take your seat thank you so much for participating i really do hope that you participated <laughs> okay all right 
Okay. All right. All right. There you go. Okay. So with regards to postural training, well, let me just go back. All right. Oops. We haven't. Uh, we are not done with the tasks yet. Okay. I would ask you again to get up from your seat. Okay. Because this is some. This is one way on how you appreciate modern learning strategies in terms of postural control. Okay. So again, you stand up. Uh, you stand up, get up from your seat, and this time you are seeing um, a diagram of a person standing up, and the arrows signifies the direction of the sway, normal postural sway, whether forward and backward, and the specific muscles contributing or working when uh, or working so that a patient won't fall or a person when. A person won't fall whenever there is anterior sway or posterior sway. Okay, all right. So let's try to um, appreciate this uh, this side of this part of the lecture. Okay. So first is I want you to stand up on your feet. Okay, and try to palpate your erector spinae. Okay. All right. So try to palpate your erector spinae. Okay. I hope you were able to do that. Now this time, I want you to move your body forward. Okay. Have you felt the erector spinae contracting? I do hope, yes. Okay, next, this time, try to palpate your abdominals. You just have to try to palpate your abdominals. I'm sure it's there, okay? <laughs> okay, so this time you try to palpate for your abdominals and do a backward sway. All right. Okay. Did it contract? Definitely yes. Now, what's the implication with this? Uh, okay. You may now take your seat. Now, in some patients, especially for patients who suffered from stroke, unfortunately, these muscles tends to be in inactivated, are not properly working, which means that if these muscles that are listed here are not properly activated, that it can contribute to a lot of complications. Example, hip pain, low back pain, a lot of pain, okay? Because, okay, because these muscles are really vital on how these patients achieve a normal posture with regards to moving forward or moving backward, all right? Okay, okay, next. And then we also have this motor strategies, strategies rather, to control sway. And it entails three distinct steps or strategies in which when a patient experienced, say, a 25% push or perturbations, it is a normal reaction that the ankle strategies are activated. When there's a push, given to a person or a patient, which is some type, some, 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 somewhat around 50% or 75%, around 50%, then that's the time that the hip strategies will be activated. And then finally, if the push is so great that it exceeds approximately 75%, then that's the time that the stepping strategies will be activated. So what's the relevance of this? Say, for example, you are evaluating your patient's posture, standing posture for the first time on a firm leveled surface. And then you've noticed that instead of doing an ankle strategy, he or she immediately did or, do, or, or showed a stepping strategy. So you know at that point, there is something wrong on how he or she controls the posture because you know that the first strategy that must happen when a person is standing on a firm flat surface, it has to activate the ankle strategy first. Okay, all right, next. Then we have the control of sway when a person is asked to stand up on a narrow beam or, an, or on a unleveled surface. Now this time, it is expected that the normal reaction would be the patient will activate the hip first, followed by the ankle, 
And then lastly would be the stepping strategy. Now, if the patient showed you stepping strategy initially when standing on a narrow beam, then that is something that you'll need to focus on your plan of care. It means that you'll need to activate important muscles that are necessary to, to make your patient assume a hip strategy. So remember, when a patient is standing on a firm flat surface, the order of strategies should be ankle first, followed by the hip, and then lastly would be stepping. When a patient is standing on an unleveled surface, the order of strategy should be hip, followed by the ankle, and then the stepping, okay? So if anything deviates from the normal pattern of control of sway, then there is something that you need to focus on your plan of care, all right? Okay, aside from the specific muscles recommended to assume a good posture. Now, what are the training recommended training guidelines that you can that you can do to your patients? Of course, when a patient is sitting, you can do some head and trunk movements to ensure that the patient can tolerate sitting without with, with the effect of, of mild to moderate perturbation. You can incorporate reaching actions. And when you say maximizing skills, how can you potentially progress the activity? And these are some of the recommendations that you can do. Okay, so the next slides, I'm gonna show you my patients with consent, okay, uh, doing their exercises. Oops, sorry. And then there's also standing balance. You may want to incorporate um, standing with some head and body movements. You can be creative with this. This is the good thing about motor learning strategies. Your creativity is the limit, okay? So you can create a lot of interventions as long as it um, uh, follows the principles or, or as long as it's guided by the principles suggested by motor learning, okay? So you can create a lot, okay, with regards to motor learning strategies, okay? So these are some of the recommended training that you can incorporate in your strategies to improve standing balance. All right, so this is one of the things that I, sh that I do whenever I teach a patient the first time uh, the first time that they assume a sitting balance. So I always make sure that there is a mirror. Hello? Hello? Uh, am I still okay? Yes, yes. All right, okay, okay, all right. So whenever I train patients in motor learning strategies, I always make sure that there is a mirror always, okay? Because mirror is one of the best material or equipment that can create a good feedback with regards to creating function. Okay, that's why, all right, um, when a patient is going to be oriented with the posture for the first time, I suggest that you let them see themselves in front of a mirror. And the line in between will guide the patient's the midline orientation of the body. Okay, all right, all right, because I guess you can relate. Whenever you try to um, learn a dance step or a or a, a dance, okay, or a steps from a dance, it will always be easier when you can see yourself doing the activity, and that is also applicable to our patients. All right, and then it's kind of pixelated, I guess. But then I'm sorry for the picture, but it's just like it's just um uh, same thing. There's a mirror, and then there's my patient standing in front of the mirror and then letting her orient herself in midline, okay? So I, I, I'm sorry for the picture, it's kind of pixelated, <laughs> okay? But it's the same thing, okay? So understand that if it's the first time the patient will be oriented in sitting and standing, okay? Mirror is one of your greatest uh, weapon here, okay? <laughs> So it's like um, it's like your armor whenever you try to go to, into a war. Okay, so in terms of training posture, um, I would suggest that you should you should train your patient in front of a mirror. Okay, all right, and then an exercise: how to maximize skill. So um, this is my patient, one of my youngest patient. Okay, she's already 
96 years old. And yeah, so one of our intervention is that just simple um, squat exercise, all right, just to make her legs strong and, in, and then activating all this three all those three systems that were mentioned a while ago is a very good intervention to develop posture. Now, you will also see here that whenever I try to teach a patient the proper posture in sitting or standing, I always make sure that I do not occlude their vision, okay? So it means you should position yourself whether on the side or at the back because you know that vision plays an important role in attaining proper posture, okay? And then this is her maximizing the skill again. So using the vestibular ball, I'm positioned on the other side and then rolling the ball towards her and then asking her to kick is again, a great way to improve his, her posture rather, her posture in terms of standing. And then another one, okay? She's already 96 years old, okay, <laughs> all right, and fully independent, okay, asking her to hold on to a stable surface and then just doing some simple leg exercises, okay, kicking, kicking at the back. Uh, I'll, I'll explain later why there are other, other um, individuals doing the exercise. There's a relevance on why they are included in the program later. I'll explain that. And then as well as simple arm movements incorporated with standing posture, with standing exercises, and ensuring that, okay, ensuring that there's um, uh, a good, a good um, space in between the legs would also maximize the skill. And lastly, to make it a little bit difficult, asking the patient to raise a very big ball, okay, <laughs> all right, while standing up is also a good way to progress the activity. Now, remember, the bigger and the heavier the weight is more challenging for your patient, okay? So that is something that you could also um, uh, do in your practice, okay? So this is also one way on how to maximize the skill. Now, in this case, I am uh, training this patient to um, assume good standing posture, and at the same time, improving the weight-bearing status of the affected leg. I'm not, yeah, okay. So the one that is weight-bearing is the affected leg and the non-weight, and then the good leg is on top of a footstool. So the idea here is that uh, I would like to increase the, the somatosensory function of the affected leg so that it could improve the overall function of the body in terms of posture. So you may want to do some challenges such as transferring of one ball to the other. Now again, in order to progress this, you can opt for a bigger ball or heavier object so that it could be, uh, it could train your patient to, um, uh, it could train your patient in terms of posture. All right. Now, next is, number two, is we have the task-specific goal-oriented therapy. In this part of the lecture, I will be focusing on sit-to-stand because it's one of the um, simpler, okay? Simpler activity, but somehow the neglected ones, okay? So when you say task-specific, if you wanted your patient to learn standing up for the first time from a chair, then you need to specifically train this patient the, the movement that are needed on, this, on that skill. And when you say goal-oriented, there should be a specific set of instructions that you need to give your patient so that it could provide a meaningful interaction with regards to the plan of care that you're giving and the actual movement that your patient is expected to do. Okay, for example, all right, so when uh, task-specific task training strategies, it is, uh, it is well known that it counteracts effects of immobility and the development of indirect impairments. Like I said, okay, like I said, in, in standing, 
okay, when, when you train your patient standing for the first time and you weren't able to activate those important muscles, it may contribute to a, um, into, a, a into an additional impairment such as pain on, in whichever part of the body. That's why in task-specific training strategies, we'll need to ensure that we train those important muscles to uh, be able for our patient to achieve the skill. Next, and much important, is that when you introduce a task-specific training strategies, what, said, what, said, what is said here, it prevents learned non-use cycles. So this is one way to counteract the insightful thing that is happening among these patients. And number three, definitely, it will promote neuroplasticity. It will tend to activate those parts of the brain that were inactivated because of the condition. Okay, so this time, let's now, okay, so this is an example of my patient who suffered from, oops, I'm so sorry, okay, who suffered from um, uh, a cranial tumor on one side of her brain that left her hemiplegic on the other side. Now, the case here is that uh, this is the first time that I saw her. And for before, before, we, before I introduced the therapy, literally, she was carried by three of her relatives to just stand up. So imagine the, imagine the difficulty of the family members just to make her stand up and then move from one place to the other. So what happened here is that when I taught her the first time on how to stand up the proper way, okay, she realized that she can she is able to do the skill on her own. And this is just such an emotional, emotional day for everybody because every literally everybody was crying when they saw their family member do the activity on her own. All right. Okay. So again, uh, this is just me, all right, doing the, the scale. And then notice that I didn't carry, carry her at all. Okay. So what did I do? Right. Okay. So that is something that you need. Uh, I would like to, I am excited to share, to share with everyone. It's, it's just, it's, it's something that, uh, the proper positioning of the body would really matter so that we can make our patient really independent. All right. Before we do that, oops, I'm so sorry. Okay, before we do that, and I think it's not showing, but it's okay. All right, let's have some activity again, okay? <laughs> because I would really want you to appreciate the, the skill. Okay, so first is, so you're sitting now, I want you to slouch your body, okay? All right, slouch your body in as if you're sitting at the edge of the chair. And then your legs should be somewhat extended, okay? I can't show you my, <laughs> my legs, okay? <laughs> Due to privacy, <laughs> privacy thing. Okay, so again, first task is, I want you to slouch on your chair, okay? with your legs semi-extended, but still your feet are on the floor, okay? Can you get the idea? Again, you're slouched on your chair, and then your legs are somewhat extended, and then your feet are on the floor, okay? So I hope, okay, let me just do it also, okay? <laughs> let me just try that activity also all right so you should be in this position and then your legs are somewhat extended okay so when you do it i will count to three and then on on on, on three you'll need to stand up all right i am sure okay <laughs> that even if i'm not started counting you feel a little bit anxious okay but i would like to prove the point okay all right ready okay come on starting position all right in, in one, two, three. Stand up. Okay. <laughs> I can't see you, but hopefully you would, you were able to do that. And I am sure you had difficulty getting up from your chair with a very awkward position. Okay. All right. Another task. 
Okay, this time, I want you to sit comfortably. Okay, sit comfortably on your chair. But one leg is extended while one leg is fully bent. Okay, so it's something like this. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So one leg is, so you sit comfortably, one leg is extended while the other leg is fully bent. Okay. All right. Again, in, in three, two, one, and stand up. All right. Okay. So I am sure you were able to do it. Okay. You were able to do it, but some of you may might feel uh, some of you might uh, felt a little um, exertion on the low back. Okay, I'm not uh, I'm not sure what, if if that's what you felt. While some of you might okay or was able to exert a little effort on one of the on, on either of the legs or or one of the legs. Okay, so. What's the implication of, okay, you may sit down now. Thank you so much. All right. So what's the implication of this activity? Actually, these are some of the common <coughs> um, uh, poor posture that some of our patients do whenever they attempt to stand up. The first one is when I ask you to slouch, okay? That is some of the, some of the um, things that they, that they usually start from whenever they stand up. And you know that when they start on, those, on that position, it creates a lot of um, abnormal movement, a lot of effort. Um, it's, it's awkward, okay? It's not right. And then when I ask you to stand up with one leg extended, uh, I think one, some of you might, some of you felt a little bit of exertion either on the back, on the hip, either of the hip, etc. So it means that if we were, if we did not, or we, if we fail to teach the patients proper strategies on how to stand up, then maybe these are some of the indirect impairments that they will feel in the future. Okay, so let's try to correct and let's try to know how do we teach proper standing up on our patients. Okay, number one, of course, you'll need to ensure that they are able to assume a good posture in sitting, okay? So the lecture that I was um, able to mention a while ago. So you ensure that your patient should be properly oriented with regards to sitting posture. Next, all right, this is the, this is now the, sorry, this is now the fun part, okay? Next is whenever you stand up, you ensure that both, okay, not just the good leg, not just the affected leg, should be moving backward, okay, approximately 10 centimeters in relation to the knee. It means that the position of your feet should be well placed back in relation to the knee. So how do you know if it's properly placed? Whenever you try to look down, you should not see your feet, okay? All right, all right, okay, all right. So again, first step is you ensure that you are seated properly, okay? Or maybe you can sit at the, ed that at the edge of the chair. Then next step, you ensure that your feet are properly placed back approximately 10 centimeters backwards or it's properly placed back back in relation to the knee so whenever you see whenever you look down you should not see your feet okay or even your toes all right and then the crucial part here is that you have to look forward and not look down okay all right ready in three two one and stand up. Okay, so I guess, okay, I guess that was easier, right? Okay, so these are the things that you'll need to remember whenever you will try your patient to stand up for the first time. Number one, okay, number one, of course, there should be a mirror in front of your patient. Number two, you should position yourself on the side. 
okay? All right, either sides. So you can you can be on the affected side, or you can be on the affected or on the good side, whichever. And then number three, okay, number three, the feet should be moving backward initially, approximately 10 centimeters backward. And then in standing up, the trunk should be extended. Okay, all right, so let's do that. Okay, so feet moving backward, all right, trunk extended, and then standing up. All right, okay. So if you didn't, if, if you weren't able to try this on your patient, then you can, you can do it maybe tomorrow, okay? <laughs> okay, so this is actually something that um, I am, uh, hap I'm, I'm, I'm proud about because uh, you can really teach a patient how to stand up on their own without any use of guard belts, okay, or any aids in order to them, in order for them to get up. Now, I have nothing against with using guard belts. It's just that um, when you use guard belts, especially when they stand up for the first time, they tend to rely on the on the assistance given by the belt and not on their legs per se. Okay, because you know that when we stand up, the legs should be working well. Because if, if you're using the guard belt, then there could be a chance that the patient's um, effort, okay, may be lessened on the lower extremity. All right. Okay. So how do we ensure there is an effective standing up? Okay. Number one, we have to ensure that there is a adequate lower extremity <coughs> force given to the legs or there's an adequate force given to the lower extremity now if a patient is not able to stand up for the first time using a standard chair or one piece of chair then you may want to elevate the seat height in this way you are encouraging the patient to stand up on their own and not without any assistance okay all right so this is an example so uh, in this scenario, the patient had difficulty standing up on a normal chair or on a, on a piece of mono black chair. So what we did, we added the height so that it could somehow make the patient independent in, ten, in terms of standing up. All right. Okay. So effective standing up means, okay, making sure that there is adequate lower extremity generation of force. You may add the seat height if the patient has difficulty doing it on a mono block chair, on a piece of mono block chair. And then number two, the strategies I've mentioned a while ago. Okay, all right. So this is my patient whom I taught, okay? Proper way of standing up for the first time. All right, so I'm gonna be showing you here the step-by-step -step procedure on how to do it. So first is, I ask her to remove her hand from the cane because you know that is something we don't want from happening because this, the patient tends to rely on pulling herself from the cane, which is detrimental in the future. All right, so I'm explaining her that you should learn not to grasp on your cane because it will make you fall in the future. Okay, next, take note that um, I ensured that both of her legs, good and bad, are on the same level and it's placed well pushed, well placed, and it's, it is well placed back. Okay, and then I'm not used, and then I position myself at the side, okay, so that I won't occlude her vision because, you know, visual, visual system is very important with regards to functional performance. And then you'll also notice in the video that I am trying to guide her trunk forward and upward, not to the point that carrying her, okay? So it's just like guidance, all right? Okay, there, okay? All right. <laughs> so I, I used, okay, so he, she fell the first time because um, she weren't able to, all right, okay, and then I repositioned her foot because I know that it's crucial when, 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 uh, when standing up, okay, and then I used the blanket as a makeshift guide, all right, there you go, okay, 
Now, the purpose of me holding the patient's trunk is that aside from, aside from guiding her, I also am trying to palpate, okay, if there are mus if the muscles required for standing up are working. There you go. So that's the, that's a, that's one of the reasons why I don't use guard belt whenever I try to teach my patients standing up for the first time because I want to ensure, I want to make sure that it's the muscles working for her and not the guard belt. Okay? All right. Okay, and then this one, the strategies that I am teaching her, okay, exercises, same session. Okay, all right. <laughs> I hope you are still okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, so there are, so this time she knew now that she knew now that placing her hand on the lap, okay, is much important rather than grasping onto her cane. All right, and this is the first time actually, uh, this is her first time on, uh, on getting up to her feet from the chair. And progression, okay. <laughs> Same patient and notice that. Okay, I uh, no assistance, okay. I ask her to hold a tray filled with a glass filled with water. And then the idea here is that she should be able to stand up on her own, okay, without spilling the water from the glass. There you go. See? Okay. So this is like one of the progressions. So this is, um, I think, uh, after three weeks of training from, three weeks or four weeks of training from the acute stage. There you go. All right, and then this is also a patient who suffered from a cerebellar stroke, okay? I've shown her video a while ago and notice how she did the standing up. It's a bit awkward. There are some, uh, there are multiple adjustments, okay? She tends to grasp onto her uh, walker, which is, um, which is, um, could be not right in the future. And then after training her, okay, teaching her the proper way, okay? So she was able to do it, okay, on her own without being carried or assisted by someone. There you go, all right, okay. So this time, how about walking? All right, now the crucial thing about walking is that, oops, uh, I think, okay, ah, okay. All right, so the points are not shown anyhow. The crucial thing about walking is that you'll need to understand that the treatment will be based on the um, the individual gait phase that, um, that is required with walking. Now, um, to, aid you with, to aid you with this part of the lecture, I'll be posting or maybe sending the, the link or the, the copy of the, the article to Dr. Shagun so that you'll be, you'll be um, informed of the different, different muscles that needs to be activated uh, in a patient suffering from from a, from a gait abnormality. So the idea here is that, same thing, if you wanted to correct gait abnormalities, you'll need to also emphasize working on the muscles to counteract the abnormality. For example, this is my patient whom I treated, uh, whom I treated using the motor learning strategies. So in the beginning, you know, you are now seeing that she, he is really suffering from a very intense um, abnormal synergy of the leg with the knee um, in a so much extended position that exaggerated the circumducting gait. Now, one of the, now during the treatment sessions, okay, my emphasis here is to break that so much extension of the leg in, in which one of my protocol is to activate the hamstrings, okay? All right. So you see, you see, you can be creative in giving the exercises for your patient, as long as you are guided with the principles on counteracting these abnormal synergies, okay? So again, one of the strategy is I made sure that he will be activated he will be activating or he is able to activate the hamstrings with so much control, all right, okay? 
so that it could counteract the circumducting aid. And this is him now. So you've noticed that when I taught her, when I taught him rather, the bending of the knee by activation of the hamstrings, it somehow lessened the circumducting gait. So you see how just one muscle activation can bring so much improvement to your patient. All right, okay, there you go. All right, now this time, the third part of the motor learning strategy is again, the practice and movement. Okay, oops, the picture is not showing, I'm so sorry, but okay. Remember that, okay, remember that there are again, three stages of motor learning. Okay, so I'm just gonna mention it, uh, mention it to you. The first stage is the cognitive stage. And the crucial part of type of practice that we give under the cognitive stage is what we call as the constant practice. When you say constant practice, this is one task done repeatedly. For example, <clears throat> when you bring this hand towards your mouth, it will require elbow flexion, okay? So in order for this patient to bring the hand towards the mouth, you need to, const to apply constant practice on the elbow flexion repeatedly, all right? Okay, so one of the practices that we give under the first stage of motor learning is what we call as the constant practice. Another one, second, is the order of practice. This is what we call as the blocked practice in which this is where the organization of your therapy is arranged as non sorry, repeating and predictable. For example, okay, <clears throat> when you put the hand towards the mouth, this will require shoulder movement, elbow movement, and elbow movement, okay? Now, how do you apply block practice under the first stage of motor learning? First, you create a program that will focus on the shoulder first. For example, three repetitions or 10 repetitions of shoulder exercise for three sets. So that's the first program. Followed by elbow exercises for 10 repetitions, three sets. And then lastly, wrist exercises for 10 repetitions, three sets. So what do you mean by block practice is that you focus first on one joint before you proceed to the next joint, okay? So it's arranged as exercise one, 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 exercise two, 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 and exercise three, three, three. So that is uh, some of the recommendations on how you will organize your exercises to your patients. Another crucial part under the cognitive stage is what we call as the distributed practice. Okay, so when you say distributed practice, instead of teaching the whole skill, such as placing the hand towards the mouth, you break those activities into a simpler task in which you, will, you should create, or it is suggested that you create a program that will focus on the shoulder, that will focus on the elbow, and also will focus on the wrist, okay? All right, okay, next, <clears throat> okay, next. Then we have what we call as the as associated stage or the second stage. In this stage, this is where the random practice or the variable practice is introduced. When we say variable practice, elbow flexion is done by bending the elbow with the shoulder in neutral. But if it's applied in variable practice, the shoulder position is altered and then doing the same movement. <clears throat> so it means it's a form of progression, okay? So you are tending to apply the same movement with, uh, in relation to different joint positions. And when you say random practice, the order or the arrangement of your plan of care is 
non-predictable and non-repeating. For example, you begin with shoulder exercise, elbow exercise, wrist exercise. Then the second round would be elbow, wrist, and shoulder. And then the third one would be wrist, shoulder, or elbow, something like that. And then finally, we have the scale, which is the automatic stage, in which the type of practice that we give here is the mast scale. When you say mass skill, you are now teaching the patient the actual skill. And number four, we have the group practice. Okay, now group practice encourages the patient to perform the exercise whenever there is less motivation. So in this case, I, I ask the caregivers to join us in the exercise by, by creating a circuit class um, form of, uh, of exercises. There you go. Okay, so this is done in a home setting wherein I, I arrange the exercises in a form of a circuit and then, and then, and then um, ask the caregivers to join the exercise. All right. Okay, and then I think this is the last part of the topic. Then we have the post-stroke post motor recovery for the upper extremity. Okay, oops, I'm so sorry. Okay, so according here, it's not shown, I'm so sorry. The causes of shoulder subluxation may be combined or uh, is a combination of both flaxid and spastic, okay? Now the flaxid component of the spastic of the upper extremity includes the supraspinatus and the deltoids muscle, which are very crucial to be activated during the flaxid stage of recovery. However, when the patient enters the spastic state, spastic stage, several muscles are now involved in contributing the shoulder subluxation, and that includes the subscapularis, the pectoralis major, the latissimus dorsi, and the side flexors of the trunk. What it means is that if you are treating a patient's who, a patient who's suffering from shoulder subluxation and he is now on the spastic stage of recovery you have to ensure that those muscle, muscles mentioned that are contributing to shoulder subluxation should be given attention to, okay? All right, okay, so this is him. Okay, all right, the picture is not showing, but uh, this is an example of, of a patient being fitted with, being fitted with a hemiplegic brace. Okay, all right. And then uh, something, my, something that I can contribute, the constraint-induced movement therapy, which I did, which I did a research um, several years back, in which the, the good arm is constrained, constrained for six hours using mass practice, and definitely it improved the performance of the patient. Okay, but for the, for two weeks, I've observed that it improved the gross movement more rather than the fine movement. So what are the requirements here? Okay, number one, you have to ensure that the patient has good balance. Number two, there should be active wrist extension for about five to 10 degrees. And number three, there should be an active finger extension of about, of, of about five degrees. Now, if that, if all criteria criteria were be were able to um, suffice by the patient, then that's the time that they can only receive CIMT. And this is something that I would like to share as well. One of the CIMT strategies that I did. So in this exercise, I am focusing on the gross movement of the shoulder, in which I let the patient trace a letter. And these letters are strategically placed, in which. Every time the patient trace letter, traces letter L to you, it kind of mimics shoulder extension. And then when he traces letters G, A, and W, it tends to mimic shoulder abduction, in which it tends to counteract the abnormal synergies happening in the upper extremity. So this is something that you can also do to your practice, okay? So this is task-specific, goal-directed to mimic the movements of the shoulder. And then this one is another patient 
okay, designed for fine motor. Now the problem is she she only had difficulty um, grasping the, the pen. So what I did is to uh, join it together with using a tape and then asking her to trace her name um, in a diagonal format. In this way, it's a form of progression. Okay, and then another one is using targets. Excuse me. All right. And then asking him to actively move the hand or the arm on a specific target and again, mimicking, okay, the natural patterns of the shoulder. Okay, so uh, I would like to emphasize, I am emphasizing the shoulder movement. Okay, I'm so sorry. And then last one is the mirror therapy. So I'm going to show you this video. Okay, all right. Okay. Let's in the mirror. Okay, mirror therapy is another tool that's being used in stroke rehabilitation. Um, it's being utilized to maximize or to get them. There you go. Okay. All right. So the idea here is that the good arm, okay, the good arm is the one in front of the mirror, and then somehow. Uh, it's somehow translating movement on the affected arm. Okay, so that is uh, also one of the strategies that you can also you do in your in your practice. Okay, so the video uh, showing here is my patient who recovered from stroke after suffering for almost six months, and then she was able to play the piano again. And that formally ends my webinar. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chell, for yes. this wonderful presentation. <laughs> okay. And I, I'm not sure how many of the participants would be able to do the moonwalk uh, from <laughs> Michael Jackson, but uh, I'm sure a lot of them would have learned uh, motor learning strategies and how to operate it in a stroke patient. Yeah, I'm so sorry if there were parts of my lecture who weren't um, showing the, well, I don't know what happened, <laughs> but I, I, I will, I will um, give uh, Dr. Shagun a copy of uh, those that were missing on the parts of my lecture so that you could have a better understanding of what I was talking about earlier. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> All right. Dr. Shagun. Uh, thank you, Chell, for your valuable time. Really, we enjoyed all the things. Uh, and uh, I find it out, uh, uh, you have got the habit to giving 100%. Okay, <laughs> so you have given us more than this thing. Okay, uh, so you have given uh, us all your experiences. And you have uh, told about the motor training, then the mirror therapy, then the, again the CIMT, and how do you are using that. And uh, I was seeing up the, actually you have got the uh, patient oriented treatment is there. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. really we would love to do up all the exercises uh, that we would uh, try to be perfect in the moon uh, walking. <laughs> so <laughs> then would be the next lecture, uh, first slide would be like this. Uh, how many participants can do the moon walking? <laughs> then only, <laughs> so that's just Thank like you. one of the crazy ideas that I usually do when I when I give this seminar in in a in a face to face setting. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Chell. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for coming on this place. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Uh, maybe that I can. Uh, there, there are few are there on the YouTube. I would be sending you the link uh, so you can give directly uh, answers to them. Thank you, Chell. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. okay. Bye bye. Is that the end? Okay. Thank you so much. Bye bye.